And so the way this cashes out is if moral relativism is really true, we're going to have to bite the bullet. And we're going to have to say that there is no such thing as justice. There is no such thing as fairness. There is no such thing as moral discourse. In fact, these terms are meaningless, ultimately. I can never say that another person has done something wrong. I can only say that I didn't prefer it, that I didn't happen to like it, that it didn't comport with my personal tastes. There's a difference between preferring something and thinking a thing is morally wrong. Now, if there are no moral rules at all, of course, all morality collapses to mere preferences. But when uh, people like myself, who believe that moral rules are objective, make claims, we need to make it clear sometimes that we're not simply making a preference claim. I might say, for example, that homosexuality is immoral. Um, now, when I say that, I am not saying that I personally don't prefer it. I am saying something beyond that. It may be that I don't prefer it, in this case I don't. It may be that the thing that's in question I prefer. I mean, frankly, I think lots, uh, some forms of pornography are appealing to my sinful nature, uh, and it isn't a, a factor there that I don't prefer it in terms of my tastes. It's that I think it's wrong. And so when I say that pornography is wrong, I'm not talking about what I like and what I don't like. I'm talking about what is morally appropriate and what, uh, what, is morally appropriate and what, it, what isn't. The first kind of moral relativism I think that a lot of uh, students will run into in college is, is what, um, what I call society does relativism. It's also technically known as cultural relativism. Now this is the kind of thing you run into in an anthropology class and the professor will point out uh, habits or uh, uh, um, customs in other cultures that are morally repugnant to some in the West but are morally acceptable in those cultures. Now, the, the basic thesis there is simply that uh, different cultures have different moral values. And this is offered as an argument in favor of moral relativism. And it goes something like this. This culture thinks they're right. You think you're right. In your Western culture, you both can't be right. So it turns out that morals really are cultural things and everybody's morality is equal, to, uh, is equal and the same and nobody has a right to say that one morality is better than the other. Even if there are these big differences, uh, I don't think the, the conclusion of moral relativism follows from the observation. Uh, how does it follow that because two cultures differ on a moral point of view, that nobody's correct? Therefore, all morals are relative. It doesn't follow at all. Uh, it, it just because the, at one time in our history we thought that the earth was flat and another time we thought that it was round and there were differences of opinion there, it doesn't mean that the, the earth suddenly was formless during that time. Um, and so in this first type of relativism, uh, which I say society does relativism, uh, societies seem to do different things, uh, uh, morally speaking, um, no moral conclusion can follow from that. It's simply an observation of different points of view, that's all it is. Everybody believes so many different things. Everyone is different. There's lots of things that you're not going to agree with. People disagree about moral rules. All right, that's true. It's a great observation. I'm not sure what follows from that. Uh, it certainly doesn't follow that because people disagree, nobody's correct. That society does relativism all coming back at you here in a different angle. People disagree. Uh, people, people disagree about a lot of matters of fact. But that doesn't make those matters of fact now simply relative facts instead of objective facts. People dis disagree about the nature of the atom, but the atom is a particular way. Uh, people disagree about the, the, the uh, things in the universe or med medical issues or legal issues, but it doesn't mean that there is no right answer, just in virtue of the disagreement alone. The second type of moral relativism says that we ought to do what society says we should do. Each culture is its, its, its own source of morality, so to speak. That's why I call it society says relativism. It's also called conventionalism, which says you don't interfere with another culture's morality. The chief problem of it is that there, there can be no, nothing like an immoral society. If the society itself is the one who determines what's right and wrong, then everything that the, that the society determines turns out to be moral just by definition. And this, what this does is it reduces morality to law or moral statements to power. If you have a group of people that are strong enough to pass laws in any particular society, then those laws turn out to be just moral by definition. 
and this raises all kinds of other problems, of course, the problem of moral reform. You can't morally reform a society. It can't get better. It can only change. Uh, you can't have moral reformers in the society because um, in order to be a moral reformer, generally, it's someone who stands up in society and says, what everybody is doing is wrong. But on this view, what everybody is doing has got to be right by definition. And guess who turns out to be wrong? The moral reformer. So somebody like a Martin Luther King or a Jesus or a Gandhi turn out to be immoral by definition on this view. And uh, someone like a Cory ten Boom who rescued Jews in Holland during the war would turn out to be immoral because she violated the dictates of the ruling culture. In the third form, the subject in view is the individual. So instead of the culture being the deciding factor, it turns out the, the individual is the deciding factor. I call this I say relativism, also individual ethical relativism. And this is the kind of thing that's characterized by remarks like, who are you to push your morality on me? Moral rules are relative. I'm the one who decides for myself, uh, that kind of thing. Who are you to say? And, um, and this is a, a very common uh, form of morality that we see in our culture, the kind of thing we run into most often. What's right for me might not be what's right for you. Morals are personal and what's right for you. In this form, as it turns out, and a lot of people don't realize this, if you hold to individual ethical relativism, there can't be any immoral individuals. Because the only way you could have an immoral individual is if an individual violates a common standard of morality. But in ethical relativism, there is no common standard of morality. Everyone does their own thing. And this is why it's clear that, that relativism doesn't really even turn out to be a morality, not a real morality. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a reformation of, uh, of what morality has, has classically been considered to be. And one point will, will, will make the case very clearly. Uh, what do you call a person who most consistently lives by the dictates of this alleged moral system? Uh, you have a moral system of uh, treating your neighbor like yourself and loving your neighbor, and you have someone who is the hero of that, who lives it out most perfectly, and you have someone like a Mother Teresa. And you say, hey, not bad. What about moral relativism? What is the hero? What is the best that moral relativism can produce? What do you call a person who, who most consistently marches to the, pe to the beat of his own moral drum and is, it is totally unconcerned with other per people's ideas of morality? Well, we have a name for that kind of person in our culture. It's a, it's a homicide detective's worst nightmare. It's a sociopath, a person with no conscience. Now, there's got to be something wrong with an alleged moral point of view that has a sociopath as its best expression. We have in our minds certain concepts that we, seem, we think are actually valid. The notions of justice, for example, the notion of fairness, the notion of tolerance, that we really ought to tolerate people that have different points of view and respect them in spite of the differences. Um, people commonly bring up the problem of evil as an argument against God. Uh, the, the fact that we have moral discussions at all and we try to determine what is the best course of action in a, any given situation. These are things that we do very naturally and they seem to be, according to our moral intuitions, uh, legitimate ways of talking about things. But as it turns out, if ethical relativism is really true, all of these things are complete nonsense. Because every one of these things um, derives its meaning from its, uh, from its relationship to an outside standard of good or evil. Uh, for example, we say, we talk about the unjust, uh, the unjust legal system. Well, that kind of presumes that, that legal systems ought to be just, that they ought to punish the guilty and not the innocent. But keep in mind, though, that little statement there turns out to be a moral rule that we don't think is a personal preference. We really treat it like something that's objectively real. Same thing with fairness. Uh, people ought to be fair. And so we, are, we find ourselves in the unenviable position, if we're a relativist, of having to say at the same time that there is no such thing as evil, no such thing as wrongdoing, that there is no such thing as justice nor fairness, there is no moral obligation of tolerance, there is no sensibility to moral discourse, and there is no way to morally improve. Now, I don't know about you, but that's too big of a, a, of a, of a thing for me to swallow. Because it seems to me that it just is the case that we ought to punish the guilty and not the innocent.